Hey everyone, Gary Turner here, Expeditioner as part of the Intro to Decolonial Sustainability course during the first half of 2024. Uh, this video is some personal reflections um, on the topic of RSPO. That's the Roundtable for Sustainable Palm Oil, for anybody that may not know. I am really interested to explore my investigation, my interrogation of this organisation, which was shared by another expeditioner as part of the live session uh, the weekend before. So I'm going to dive straight in, and I'm going to start actually with an interesting story. Well, I think it's interesting anyway. Did you know, well, a lot of you know I work in the chemicals industry. However, did you know that I've actually been on the ground in Malaysia at a palm plantation? That happened back in about 2004, I think, 2005, 20 years ago. And it's really intriguing to me that even back then, something didn't feel quite right. I couldn't put my finger on it. I didn't understand enough systemically and interconnectedness-wise to join the dots because of my own coloniality, my own blind spots. But I just remember the feeling in my body the as there was basically kilometer after kilometer after kilometer of identically looking palm trees and how those are actually harvested were literally a local um, worker scurried up literally the palm tree with a scythe and hacked these huge 10 to 15 kilo pods of palm oil to the ground and that was how these things were harvested back in back nearly 20 years ago i'm not sure how different that is today um i'm not sure it would be massively different but just a little bit of context and scene setting that I did visit um, a palm plantation nearly 20 years ago. And the reason being, the reason I visited that palm plantation is that I've done a lot of work with the RSBO in the past. And again, I think it's relevant to share. Uh, contextually, my first major job within the chemicals industry was with what was a company called Cognis. It's where I met my wife, Jackie, which later became Emery Oleo Chemicals. And Emery Oleo Chemicals is a joint venture between two companies, GC, part of the Taiwanese PTT um, petrochemical company, and Syme Dali Plantations from Malaysia. So Emery Oleo Chemicals is a 50-50 joint venture. Now, why this is relevant before I dive directly into the RSPO is because I want to show you how some of the other elements of coloniality show up straight away. So within Emery, one of their shareholders is the Taiwanese um, PTT. And you can see straight away that their products that they supply into their petrochemical raw materials go into plastic packaging, home and personal care, agricultural um, ingredients, automotive, construction, etc. And I challenge myself all the time around this, but how much of this, pro this these product groups, how much of those are in need versus a want to fund capitalism extractive growth, continuous growth, etc. And the other um, opening reflection I want to offer you is the other part, Syme Darby plantations from Malaysia. One of the key things that they talk about with regards net zero, etc., is the fact that they have developed higher yielding seeds that they call genome select. So, yeah, just the whole already the two companies that are half owners in my previous employer many, many years ago, basically are deeply wedded to monocrop, deeply wedded to perpetuating capitalism based on consumption. And that's the push from industry. That's before you or I even decide whether or not we actually wish, wish to buy those products. There's a lot of pressure and challenge around individuals making different choices, but for sure it's massively more a supply side economic issue over whether or not we choose to buy these materials. They will be produced and they will be pushed regardless. That is my personal opinion um, so far. So I just thought that might be an interesting opening before I actually dive into the RSPO. What I'm going to share, I've been tracking a, a number of notes as I've gone through this course. So the RSPO, again, the Roundtable of Sustainable Palm Oil. So I just want to start with a positive message of sorts around the RSBO. And why I want to mention that um, is very much the fact that 
the RSPO is doing something that I think far too few movements, far, far, far few two organizations are able to do. And that is to actually bring varying stakeholders across different contexts, different cultures, different backgrounds. And I think if I just show, show you what I mean by that, um, if you look at the different types of stake, stakeholders that make up the RSPO, you've got the actual palm growers at source, you've got the processors and traders, yeah, you've got the Unilevers and the, you know, the Procter & Gamble's, the people that are turning um, palm oil into different products. You've got the retailers, banks and investors and NGOs and policymakers. There's very few organizations or movements that I've seen that have got that amount of systemic leverage, which could be used for much better and much good, but isn't being used today by the RSPO. So I just wanted to give that as a framing, as a, as, as a, personal, a personal reference. But now I get into the, the problematic aspects of the RSPO, of which there are a number. So first, first, palm oil offsetting. So palm oil offsetting is something that is being used by the RSPO as part of a number of ways of trying to progress sustainable, so-called sustainable palm oil. So let me just share a little bit with you around that. So people can buy RSPO credits. So one, one credit equals one ton of RSPO certified palm oil, palm kernel oil, or palm kernel expeller. Da -da 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 -da. Why buy or sell CPO as a credit, as a buyer, as a seller? Blah, -de blah, -de blah, -de blah, -de blah. Basically, this is the same as carbon offsetting. So people can carry on doing exactly what they're doing as long as they're buying credits because it helps offset the harm that their business is doing. So that's a, a good example of coloniality and Western neoliberal capitalism coming through as part of this so-called sustainable palm oil. So I just thought I'd share that that's part of the business model that makes up the RSPO. What I think is also very important to note, and again, I took this from their website, Excuse me, jumping around, but it's just the uh, it's, it's just me, and I think the way that I, I can try and process this with you is quote, and this is latest news, literally less than a week ago, as I record on the nineteenth of April, twenty twenty four. On the fifteenth of April, this news article was on the RSPO website. Quote: In two thousand twenty two, a total of two point eight million tons of RSPO certified sustainable palm oil entered just the European market. Europe remains the largest buyer, 45% of CSPO, and has been a catalyst in leading the global market transformation. So that's nearly 3 million tonnes of palm oil that's been extracted from the global south countries, particularly Malaysia, particularly Indonesia, to be used in biofuels, cosmetics, Western food, that should basically, should stay by right, in the global south. It's for those local communities. It's their raw materials. It's their land. Yet Western hegemony, Western neo neoliberal capitalism says, this is progress. It's really exciting that actually we're seeing this huge global transformation in sustainable palm oil, helping to drive change in the West. And I'm just like, hey, if 45% of so-called sustainable palm oil is going to Europe, that means there's another 55%, which is over 3 million tonnes on top going to the rest of the world, which means over 6 million tonnes of so-called sustainable palm oil is leaving, particularly Indonesia and Malaysia, to go to the rest of the world. That is coloniality in action right there. Not only, of course, our local communities being moved off the land, as we know, but also that's literally just raw extraction of food, palm oil, and coconut palm oil and palm kernel oil to be used in the local in the local communities in the local area, like that's no longer possible because it's actually going into me being able to brush my teeth with a product from GlaxoSmithKline or have a shower for a product from Procter and Gamble. And I'm not judging anyone. I probably should judge someone myself, most importantly, because I still struggle to to get my addiction off of these products as well. I'm trying to find other ways beyond the plastic product, but beyond these big companies but they are such monolith organizations. They own everything else. It's quite a challenge to step away from. So that's an example of where Western 
coloniality is showing up, I believe, within um, even just within this narrative, that it's really positive, as of less than a week ago, as I record, that we're seeing massive transformation in sustainable palm oil. But no one's talking about the fact that this all of this material is leaving the very countries that, in essence, own it, their land. Just find that particularly bizarre. Um, but that's just Western capitalism. So other ways where coloniality shows up for me, again, and this is sort of greenwashing misdirection narratives in a way, is the different types of supply chain model um, that are being offered uh, that make up the RSPO. So let me share with you what I mean. So if I share my screen again, what you can see is this supply chain standard. So in essence, there are a whole range of different ways that you can become um, you know, certified by the RSPO to show that you are part of this move to transformation globally of so-called sustainable palm oil. So here it is, resources. Whole range of different certification standards. What do you need to do to conform to become RSPO certified, et cetera, et cetera. Let me try and share this other screen, sorry. Here it is. So a nice long document of 60 pages, which takes you through different chain of custody, different book and claim, micro users, derivatives. So there's just loads and loads and loads of information around how you can try and trace your sustainable palm oil so that you then get the badge, the sticker of RSPO to show particularly Western markets that we can feel good about the fact that we're not deforesting, we're not hurting orangutans as much because it's actually doing good by producing more of this so-called, increasingly, as we saw from Sindabi, genetically modified seeds that go into this monocrop palm oil. There are a range of, you've got identity preserved, you've got segregated, mass balance, and book and claim. So there's four different ways that you can so-called be uh, purchase sustainable palm oil. And that, to me, is just a load of misdirection. How many different ways can we try and throw a dart at the dartboard to show that we're being better and that we're trying to save the world through more sustainable palm oil? Nowhere in these narratives does it talk about harm being caused to, lo to local communities in the areas where it's being extracted. Nowhere is there any conversation around how much money is being made by Western corporations and Western governments off the back of those that are earning so-called lower wages um, in Malaysia and in Indonesia, etc. So it just blows my mind that there's so many different ways, basically, to misdirect end consumers around the RSPO. Now, I want to take you back to some of the other analysis that I've been doing on this. And this pops up in terms of mass balance. If you haven't come across mass balance before, this, so identity preserved is basically traceable to a single mill. So if there's a palm producer in part of Indonesia, IP preserved, sustainable palm oil, means you can actually directly trace all the way back in the supply chain to a single mill. Segregated means you can trace back to a mix of segregated or IP, identity preserved mills, could be one or more, but you can definitely trace all the way back. Mass balance is where things get really, really dodgy. Mass balance means that producers are using a mix of so-called sustainable palm oil and non-sustainable palm oil, i.e. fossil fuel alternatives, and they're mixing the two together, and that's being pushed as an RSPO certified grade of sustainable palm oil. That, to me, is hugely problematic because most consumers will never, ever think about that. Excuse me. So if we go to colonial narratives. Oh, sorry. If you go to the front page, sorry, of the RSPO website, let me bring that back up again. I would love to share with you some thoughts that I'm having around misdirected narratives um, that I believe we're seeing on the RSPO website. Let me just share that with you. 
So first of all, a very, oh, look at that. Maybe we're actually going to be helping reduce deforestation and not impacting elephants' um, habitats by, by buying R RSPO material. That's the first thing that I'm sure you would agree is coming up as a clear narrative from the front page. Another one is there's lots of people celebrating uh, local communities, seemingly waving their hands up in the air, how exciting it is that uh, we're part of a uh, transformational change globally. And then this part as well. This is what I see as a massively Western, but increasingly global hegemonic narrative. Why sustainable palm oil is better than a boycott. A direct plea from this RSPO organization not to stop, not to boy, boycott um, consumer good companies, not to boycott the NGOs. Do keep buying products that come from sustainable palm oil because that's better than a boycott. You keep on making a difference with the transformational uh, change towards sustainable palm oil. Grow more, buy more. That is the narrative that's coming through loud and clear from that particular message. There is also another na narrative as well. Here it is. Our global impact. Palm oil has a positive impact on the planet and people when grown sustainably. There is nothing in here around the harm being caused to Global South communities, to those where the material is being grown. I'm going to come back to that in a second. But palm oil having a positive impact. So the absolute growthist narrative that to do anything but keep growing sustainably and selling to Western markets will be problematic. I just find all of that such interesting. And I think I just I just observed the coloniality in those narratives. And this is where it's been really helpful with Lorraine in particular and, and Sam over the recent months and a couple of years. It just reminds me that it isn't a straight global south, global north divide. The narrative being peddled by the RSPO, which is a global south led organization with heavy global north influence, is one of growth at all costs. So into a couple of other things I'd like to wrap up my presentation with. So let me just share my document again. So how RSPO helps talks about being a global certification as main tools of the RSPO. So we've got a standard way of tracking everybody. We can go back to source, we can use mass balance. But we're the global standard. We coordinate a badge that people can stick on their products to show how amazing they're being. This is really important. This is where I observe more coloniality kicking in. Of the five founding members of the RSPO, four are global north uh, institutions, one being the charity of the World Wildlife Fund, three others being major corporations in the global north, Unilever, one of the biggest consumer good planet pl um, companies on the planet, AAK, which is a global feed and oils manufacturer, and Migro, which is a major Swiss retailer. The latter three all have active capitalist interest in securing supply of palm oil for their business models. And then it says, in response to the global call for sustainable palm, these five organizations set up the uh, MPOA, Malaysian Palm Oil Association. Since then, we've developed blah, 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 blah. So the evidence of coloniality's web of power directly influencing the so-called sustainable palm market is clear to see. Wondering what you're thinking and what are your thoughts? Uh, what was I going to share? I was going to share something about the standards review, but there's something else I would like to share with you. So the steering group, this is really interesting. The steering group, of the RSPO is a combination of Procter & Gamble, huge consumer goods company, Musimas, a huge oleochemical manufacturer and distributor, Golden Agri, an Asian, Singaporean-based agrochemical company, Bumitama Agri, another huge Global South-based agri company, and WDF. Is there, gonna, is there gonna be any conflict of interest? You bet your bet and dollar is. And it gets worse, because the lobbying and influence on the RSPO is clear from impartial. That can be seen by the type of company. And then it gets even worse. Golden Agri, as of the 13th of uh, October last year, obviously that's gone ahead of itself. Golden Agri has a number of complaints against it 
Bear in mind, Golden Agri is one of the steering group of the RSPO. This is just by doing my own research into the complaints made on their own website. You can see that in Indonesia, the Kapuas, Hulu people, sorry if I've uh, missed, sorry, the Forest Peoples Program and TUK Indonesia, they've raised issues around land takeover, dissatisfaction of smallholders, etc. That's one with Golden Agri. Here's another one for Golden Agri from 2021. Expansion into Imbu, I'm going to bastardize their name, so I'm not going to do that, but basically encroaching and expanding into, it seems to be indigenous people's land in Indonesia to, to expand there. And then there's another one from March 2020. Operating within permits, its employees are involved in the payment of bribes. So as I go to wrap up my summary here, basically, this is coloniality on steroids. One of the steering group of the RSPO has been actively and regularly breaching the very um, the very certification that they are meant to be upholding. So there's a few patterns I've observed. I've got to 21 minutes. What an interesting um, reflection. Thank you, navigators, for the, the opportunity to investigate that. And I'm going to sit and refer the reflection. Thank you.